those people who are perhaps even correctly identifying a lot of these symptoms are being told that capitalism is the cause. Mm-hmm. In, in some cases, even by people who, you know, are the champions of all the activity in the first place, a lot of it's kind of apologism. It's, it's that, oh, well, this is what capitalism requires. This is like the occasional downside of capitalism is that, yeah, we need to spend a whole bunch of money and save all these people who made terrible decisions. But if you're calling it capitalism, you ought to be mindful of how capital is being treated and very probably that it's just you know, you've just been lied to. What you're looking at is is something else. Hence, this is not capitalism. Alan, I have a confession here. I'm a massive, massive fan of this book. Um, oh, thank you. Massive fan of that book. Um, and here's the reason why is because you take a sledgehammer to so many uh, traditional valuation, uh, thoughts, ideas, like anybody who just got a, an MBA, I would highly recommend that they pick up your book and read it because it'll pretty much take a, take a sledgehammer to their MBA. Um, but I say this all in a really good way because it's like, we've been so indoctrinated in how people think about valuation and people think about markets and, um, Mm -hmm. And I just think that some of your points are so important. So I want to start off the conversation with uh, the start of your book, which when I read this, I literally was like pumping my fist in the air because I was I was so thrilled with the way that you started this book off. Uh, you start off with a Joe Rogan quote, and you're talking about martial arts. Mm-hmm. And, um, and Rogan says that we had no idea what any of these martial arts like what were the best or whatever until 1993. So tell talk to our audience, explain to them what you're getting at with this. Tell them a little bit of the story sure. yeah, and why, yeah. why you find this to be so important. So even explaining that there's there's quite a bit of backstory to get to that point. Um picking up on some of the things you've already said in the introduction, even besides the Joe Rogan point, even even besides the the MMA angle. Uh, so there is actually a co-author on the book as well. His uh, name is Sasha Myers, a very good friend of mine, uh, former colleague we met on the job uh, when I still worked in TradFi, which I did for a long time until until quite recently. Um, and I bring that up for a couple of reasons. So one is that uh, he he wrote that chapter, actually. I, at my insistence over probably about four or five years, I was telling him to write this. And actually, the book turned out to be a good a good excuse to finally get all these thoughts down on paper. Um, so I'm partly saying that to excuse any uh, ignorance of the minutia of MMA that may come out from uh, from from teasing out this discussion, uh, but also to give him credit. Like it is it is his idea. Yeah. I, I think it's a very good idea. I, I was very excited when I had. I, I'll take slight credit for saying it was my idea to put it right at the start of the book because I thought that the ideas it introduced were important enough but also accessible enough Mm -hmm. and a lot of the rest of the book is not very accessible um before going into the mma bit though i also wanted to mention that uh the praise you gave it in that little introduction which was very kind by the way thank you very much we we've never at least not publicly at least not to me i don't think i've ever had exactly that praise before and i realized as you were saying it is because of what your background is mm-hmm. uh, but i'm so glad that you that you did say it that way I, I, I won't be able to quote it verbatim but like you know like everybody who got an mba should now read this and like unlearn yes. all of that um which is uh is, is very nice of you to say because I think that was largely on purpose. This is maybe something we can get to in a bit. I don't want to go too far off the quest because you want to talk about the MMA quote. Um, but why I wanted to mention that, uh, you know, give Sasha credit as well and highlight where we used to work. It, it's very much a reflection of the the ethos of our, well, his current employer, actually, but I'm a, a, a bit more liberty to discuss it, I suppose, given I've left uh, my former employer their attitude towards it was an investment firm uh, and their attitudes towards investing towards uh financial markets as a whole you know how best to approach them how best to think about them a lot of the book probably not the mma part but a lot of the rest of the book is kind of a distillation of conversations that we would just been having with each other for about four or five years as i mentioned the mma angle was kind of incidentally amusing that we we managed to get that in um but it's it's very much uh, 
it, it, it's come from a, a place of sort of frustration, if not hate in some cases with, you know, what we were seeing in our jobs. Um, and, and then obviously there's a, there's it a comes, of where we Alan, tie that in Bitcoin too. <laughs> it comes out in the book that, and, and, and hate is such a strong word, right? <laughs> It comes out in the book, but it comes out in such a deep, critical thinking, just bludgeoning of <laughs> the bludgeoning these. Is good, I like that. I'll, just, of, I'll try to reuse that. Yeah, of these past like uh, mantras that you mm -hmm. just hear from business schools yep. and just like uh, that people believe because everyone else believes them, and hard, yes. very few have actually thought about why it might be true. And you know, we like to think that we have and we've discovered they're false. Yes. But anyway, should I get back to the MMA part? I, I yeah. wanted to make sure I mentioned that before we <laughs> potentially moved on. Yeah. So Sasha's idea about MMA, which, uh, which he told me a very long time ago, we spent a lot of time teasing out. I encouraged him to, uh, find a way to set up the rest of the ideas that, that we go into in, you know, as I said, kind of less accessible detail layer in the book. His idea about MMA is that it is a truly free market and in particular it's a it's a free market of historical interest because until was it 92 93 mm -hmm. until ufc was set up um it's actually it's more ufc than mma just to be clear it's like the forcing together of all the of all the different uh styles to see what actually wins prior to that there had really been no no way to know which fighting style actually was superior because of the way that almost all of them were, you know, taught and more gate kept, I suppose. Like the way the competitions would would run, almost what's what's kind of nice, what's interesting, what's unique about UFC is forcing all of them <laughs> to come together and to, to actually finally find out which one is the best. And so the reason we include it is that, I mean, the rest of the book is basically about, it's not really about Bitcoin, that's kind of clickbait, but it, it's about capitalism and it's about free markets. Um, and I think it's as much about the philosophy of these, like how to think about them and how to how to evaluate knowledge within them and what the role and importance of knowledge is in these systems. And so that's really the focus in the in the chapter about MMA that, this UFC was an experiment in attaining knowledge because mm -hmm. this it, it forced this knowledge to the fore that had never really previously existed. I think it may be an interesting way to kind of weave toward, or I guess weave away from MMA itself, weave towards uh, whether it's economics or whatever other topics we we talk about is that it couldn't have been settled any other way. I think that's that's like the nice a, a nice clean way of describing the one particular angle of thought that we have that you could not have deduced the answer to this. There's nothing intellectual you could have done to arrive at basically which is the best fighting style. Um, you had to run the experiment, um, and you had to you know have some uh, kind of appreciation of what it was you were watching to then infer the knowledge that came out of it. And so it's it's all those threads, you know, uh, practicality versus uh, intellectualism, kind of dynamism in terms of forcing the issue rather than just static analysis, uh, being very clear about what you do and don't know. Like these are the threads that we then take into economics and capitalism and so on. Uh, but we really like that MMA is a, is a great kind of accessible introduction to that. I, I recently read this book called The Infinite Game by Simon Sinek. And I've heard that's been highly recommended. I've never read it, but yeah. It's it's really good. But uh in in essence, he's just getting at like a lot of people have convinced themselves they're that they're playing some type of finite game. And I think when you're talking about like martial arts, they have uh they have bound themselves like if you're doing karate or you're doing uh you name it right they're bound by the the rules the movements the whatever and they were playing this very uh finite bound game and now they were being forced to go into what uh simon Sinek would refer to as an infinite game where there's really no rules mm. the rules are you you just gotta win right like you yeah. you gotta get out there and you gotta beat your opponent 
with whatever mechanism or whatever school of thought you want want to apply to it. And it's so representative of free and open markets, right? Which is yeah, yeah. where you, you go in the book next. So yeah, you go into the next chapter, then you're talking about the efficient market hypothesis, which holy <laughs> Lord, man, like <laughs> his. You, you have a quote. I want to read this quote because I, I, for me, this just like really represented what you were really getting at with this chapter. You say prices reflect all available information. If you believe that, you've already been hoodwinked. So get into get into that idea, and um, really kind of just some of your your broader thoughts on this idea of the efficient market hypothesis, which is basically a religion in these mm. these schools, right? Like, so I don't I don't mean to put you on the spot too much. Well, I kind of do because I don't want to put myself on the spot too much. I, <laughs> it might it might be helpful. If I think you would be better at providing this, I can try if you want. Again, I'm yeah. not trying to, it's not like a gotcha or anything, but if you define the efficient market hypothesis first, yeah, partly I mean, for my, just so I know yeah. exactly what I'm arguing against, because that's another thing that it's, it's, I think you're right. It's kind of become so much of a religion that a lot of people uh, in finance, I should say, obviously not in the wider world, they operate as if it's true and will repeat sort of some of the very downstream consequences of it, but without actually addressing what the hypothesis is itself. So I, I just want to make sure that we're being clear about what yeah. it is I'm now attacking. <laughs> I would even, I would maybe even take it a step further. I think that the mantra that's repeated in academia is uh, around the efficient market hypothesis is all available information the market has, has already synthesized and therefore it's impossible to outperform the market. So you might right, not right, even okay. try. So, so yeah, right. so this, this idea that you you can't, I, I'd, I'd make it a bit more formal just because it then makes it easier to attack that uh, not just you can't possibly outperform, but that any outperformance is luck. I think yes. is also a yes part of it. Uh, yes, point. because all the information is in the price. Like that's what the market does is, is um, yeah, turn it all into into something that uh, nobody could possibly know more than, I guess, which does have, it does have kind of a, a nice appeal to it. This is, I'm maybe interested in your thoughts on this precedent, actually. I'm going to defend it. I'm going to, well, steal my just <laughs> I love this. That, that I think the reason a lot of people fall for this is that it, it superficially resembles a lot of, I wouldn't say mantras exactly, I'd be a bit more positive than that, I guess. Truisms, let's say, about free markets in general, yeah. right? It kind of taps into a lot of the same sentiment around objecting to central planning, say, that, you know, the central planner could never possibly know uh, anything approaching the the combined knowledge that emerges when people engage freely in a market, uh, which I I believe I would subscribe to that as a proposition. Um but it sort of it, it superficially uses something like that as a starting point in its own argument, but but it arrives at something that I would argue is just complete nonsense. Well, and you you get into this idea of what I value and what you value are are very different. And if I have a ton of buying power behind this thing that I value, which might be somewhat nonsensical, Right. The reason why I'm buying a particular stock or I'm buying whatever in the market, in the free and open market, my actions don't have to be efficient. Right. They mm. might actually be extremely inefficient. And if I'm applying a ton of retained earnings and buying power behind that, that uh, incentive, that self serving incentive, which isn't, you know, if you lined up a hundred people, they would all greatly disagree with the rationale behind why I'm doing something. There's no way that the the overall system that we're talking about can possibly be inefficient if an actor like that exists inside of it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I, I go even that I'd go further. I I'd say that the the way in which the word efficiency or efficient or whatever is being used in this context basically doesn't make any sense. And that's that's kind of the root of it. I, th this this manifests in in a number of ways. I think one being that um, if you subscribe to this, you you kind of have to think 
something like all of the all of the data that markets generate uh, somehow perfectly captures it. Like you don't need any more information. Like that is the information about what's yeah. happening, which I think is kind of insane. And I think the the alternative approach, like the the first principles place you need to start to unravel all of this is realizing that there is nothing in a market that hasn't originated with just people making decisions, individuals deciding what to do with their time, money, whatever, right? And you, you have to start there and build up rather than start at, at the data and build down. Because I, th I think this might be a, a little bit harsh. It might be a bit of a straw man in this case, but I think what uh, proponents of the efficient markets hypothesis would, they probably wouldn't do it publicly, but you know, what they would be thinking privately when they're trying to explain this to themselves is that if you start with the data and you work down and you see that people are doing things that sort of go against whatever the aggregate of the data suggests they ought to, whatever they even mean by that. I mean, even that I think is kind of silly, but they're, you know, they're, they're outliers in some particular direction they, they, they would pathologize that behavior as inefficient. And that's almost what they, they kind of construct this definition of efficiency as like aligning with whatever ends up happening on average, mm -hmm. uh, which I think if you're really critical in, in, it's almost like a reductio ad absurdum at that point, it, you know, I mentioned a second ago that I doubt they would, would formulate this argument publicly, but if you, if you force yourself to that point, it's just kind of clear to me, at least that that doesn't at all reflect certainly doesn't reflect how any individuals behave, but it given the, all of the, the top level data and markets as a whole are emerging from the interactions of individuals. It can't even possibly explain what's happening at the top level, even though that's where they started. Mm -hmm. And so you, once you're kind of, once you're clear about all of this, or at least clearer, you, you, in my mind, at least what it, it's kind of freeing, right? It allows you to just get rid of all of this baggage. Yeah. Just think about what do individuals do or, or, or how are individuals behaving? How are they likely to behave? And, and then build up from there. And then to go back to something you mentioned uh, a minute ago, maybe a more kind of a tangible way of understanding all of this is uh, the, the idea of just outperformance, right? So basically, can you invest in something that is better than the average? Um, or can, can, you, can you invest in something better than the average for reasons other than blind luck, right? Yeah. Um, it seems to me just completely obvious that you can because, not that you will, obviously, like it, uh, it's probably also definitely true that, you know, half of the people attempting to do it would end up performing below the average, right? But that some people can and that it's not luck because it might be luck as well. But for the people for whom it isn't luck, what they have done is more accurately predicted how individuals are going to behave, what they are going to value and just kind of run that out like okay well you, you and you wouldn't just to be clear like you wouldn't do it on you wouldn't try to model everything it wouldn't be like okay this person thinks this this person thinks this and then kind of i don't even know what the approach would be at that maybe literally build a model and like see what numbers pop out of it it would be more hypotheses and heuristics about what people in general are likely to do or even some particular subset some demographic are likely to value, how they're likely to behave, what else is likely to happen. Ultimately, you're when you take this approach, you're just reasoning about humans. You're reasoning about other people. It's not remotely mathematical, or it shouldn't be, really. It's clearly not scientific either. And so that I think that's another thing that rubs up that rubs these people up the wrong way. Um, that if you are starting with the top level data, it's very tempting to do lots of like science right or no. statistics i say and then pretend that the outcome of the statistics is is scientific when i would say again you know nothing nothing intellectually required for that domain exists right you can't have a you can't measure properly you can't have a control uh you can't isolate the variables because every individual is like their own infinite set of variables. Like you, is the idea again, when you go down to the individual level of trying to mathematize what it is you value is just clearly really silly. So again, back to this, this point about our performance, all you're really needing to do, I say all like it's easy. It's obviously not easy, but uh, for the ones who do it successfully, what they have done is 
basically correctly predicted what other people will value or, yes. or predicted it more correctly than the average person who's also trying to predict the same thing. Yes. And that seems like kind of obvious that you could do it, <laughs> I guess. I mean, the example we give in the book, you, you may have been going to mention this anyway, but um, it's, it's kind of, it's exaggerated on purpose, but just to make the point, like to make it as accessible as possible is that the, uh, I think this is true, at least I checked it when we, when we wrote it, that the best performing large cap, you have to make various caveats around this, but uh, the best performing large cap US stock over the 2010s was Netflix. And you could, I suppose, again, go through that like ridiculous process of the top down building the model of who's going to do this and what and when and why. Or you could literally just have thought in 2010, streaming is better, it is going to win, <laughs> which yeah. is essentially even fra like phrasing it that way, which is probably more natural in you know conversational English, makes it seem like it's about technology, which it kind of is. But again, it's really just more about people. Like, well, what you're really that's a commercial proposition. That's like people will prefer to get a Netflix account <laughs> than. Um, well, renting videos, I guess, but also well, just, you know, watching regular linear TV. What's what's so interesting about academia and how they've tried to uh, develop math around this. One of the most mm -hmm. popular models that they have is this capital asset pricing model. Mm -hmm. right? And so going to your example of CAPM is what this is called. If you go to business yeah. school, you'll be you'll be definitely be taught this model. You'll yes. have to do these equations. You'll have to to figure out the math on this. And taking Netflix as an example, if we could go back to 2010, there's not anywhere in that calculation or in that model where you're talking about streaming that like the underlying yeah. <laughs> yeah. asset that's like going to produce the value prop in the future and competitive mode or none of that. Like you're not talking about the mm -hmm. IP. You're not talking. No, you're looking at how much the price has wiggled around from a volatility standpoint. And then you're looking at the price of everything else on the mar market and how it wiggled around over some made up period of time from past five years or three years mm -hmm. or whatever arbitrary time you want to select. And then you're plugging that th this data into the and you're looking at the risk, quote unquote, risk free rate of, you know, treasuries and you're plugging <laughs> these these numbers into this model. And then it's telling you potentially how much outperformance Netflix yeah. is going to have. I just wanted to jump in here and tell you about this new valuable resource that we created for you. The biggest challenge to taking control of your personal finances, improving your investment returns, and building a better future is just getting started. This means getting organized, having a plan, and being disciplined. As Mark Twain once said, the secret to getting ahead is getting started. If you're not satisfied with where you're at financially, whether that be not having enough savings at the end of each month, watching your cash being eroded away by inflation, or maybe you're not sure where to get started with investing. Down in the description below, we put together a free guide for you called the four simple steps to take control of your personal finances and life. You can get this free guide by clicking the link in the description below. Well, it, it again, it assumes, I'm glad I, I touched on this briefly. It assumes that that is a scientific domain. It's, it's, for yes. that to make any, not even be right, because it could be right yeah. by accident, right? But to even make sense, that assumes that everything that went into all those numbers popping out over whatever period you're drawing them from will also be the case in the future. And I actually find it kind of baffling. I'm sort of just, I'm thinking aloud now that none of this is in the book, but if you believe that, like if you were, if you, if that made sense to you as a methodology, why would you want to be an investor? Like, what is it you even think you're doing? I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Um, I, well, I guess this is the world. A bit less facetiously, though, right? I can I can link this to a couple of things we've mentioned already. So yeah, that approach, the CAPM approach, it assumed be a bit more rigorous about like why the methodology is really silly. It assumes a couple of things other than just kind of being, you know, I called it not scientific, right? It assumes that... Um, it, it assumes a kind of a static environment. It assumes nothing is going to change. Yeah. Whereas I would say this is like a more, uh, a nicer interpretation of, of that um, insult I ended on there is that what's fun about investing or one thing that can, that can be fun about it 
is thinking about what's going to change, right? Like it's, it's, it shouldn't be, I don't think, I mean, I feel really bad for anybody in this position, certainly professionally that their investment decisions are just the result of like running an Excel or something and just whatever pops out. It's like, oh, I guess that's what we should invest in. I mean, I've never done that. Uh, Sash has never done that. And, you know, we we like our jobs because it's a, it's it's really interesting thinking about the human angle to you know, like Netflix, for example, but basically anything, right? Um, which is far more dynamic. So you've got a, a dynamic versus static. It's also, it requires a, uh, what would you call it? Like a, a bottom up analysis rather than a top down one. So the, mm-hmm. the cap M again is, is exceptionally top down. It's only giving you the numbers, right? You So all these numbers that you have to plug in, um, there's there's no required understanding of where they came from in the first place. It's almost like a non sequitur to even ask. It's like, what are you talking about? Like, there's no variable for that. Where, where, where do we put, you know, people's values or feelings or whatever? Whereas, uh, the bottom up approach is obviously starting with thinking about people, like what will people want? What will they value? Um, and it's, it's just, yeah, it's much more, uh, it's, it's both more appropriate and more, more interesting as well. I think the, the next chat, we could talk about that topic. I could, <laughs> I could literally go on for hours on that. We just go topic. through, go through every one of these tap M E M H, uh, you what you you did the the risk free rate you, you made fun of that for half a second or so before moving on. <laughs> well, I, I guess if I was gonna not, we aren't gonna move on. So, uh, from a first principles standpoint, like if I've worked and I've retained buying power, mm-hmm. right, and I'm going to invest that that buying power into something, I want to invest in something that is going to produce a product or service that adds efficiency, makes people's lives better because they're freeing up their time. Right. And if I'm looking at it, not from a, cause that's more of like a VC lens, right? If I'm looking at it as a business that already exists and I'm saying this business is just really saving people a ton of time. It's, it's adding value to way more people. And and my projection is that it's going to continue to outpace their previous amount of efficiencies that they've added to people's lives and the rest of the market's priced here. And this is priced there. I should probably own this because it's going to perform great. Like that's investing to me. Yeah. And like, I agree. <laughs> and I know that sounds like really it's big, highly controversial, like simple, <laughs> but it is controversial. It's not the, it's not the norm, the norm on wall street and people that are actually allocating capital. It's, it's, it is so uh, abstracted away from what we just described. And at least in my mm-hmm. opinion, it's been abstracted away. But anyway. Yeah, no, no, I, I completely agree. I think it's, um, this might sound a bit harsh. It might require a little, a little bit of elaboration, but it's basically a cargo cult. It's applying uh, methodologies that work in a completely separate domain um, that, seem like they work in this domain but actually they don't and actually they don't capture any of the causality that is required to understand this domain Mm -hmm. um but they seem very serious they seem very scientific basically that's that's the word i keep coming back to that's i think that is actually really key to to unraveling a lot of of not just this, you know, efficient markets, but um, but uh, other things that we talked about too. I like maybe even trying to link it back to the uh, to the MMA discussion too. That as soon as you let go of the idea that this even can be scientific, uh, you're just freed up to to I think appreciate it uh, far more deeply, far more seriously, even. Um, so, like the MMA angle would be something like. This, I think this is good, both in terms of the accessibility, as I mentioned before, but in this case, it's like even more obviously ridiculous. If you, rather than just, you know, getting different fighting styles to fight each other, you did some kind of statistical analysis on them in isolation and then built a model that would churn out who's going to win. Like, which do you think is better? Should you, you know, do you, do you, do you do the analysis and build the model or do you just let them fight? I think you just let them fight. Mm-hmm. it's it's superior knowledge <laughs> that you gain from that and it's you're you're freed up to do it if you don't think it's remotely scientific 
and I think the, the main difference, because that maybe does seem a bit ridiculous in isolation, but the main difference b- between that environment and, you know, investing financial markets um, is only really the amount of data there is in the first place. I actually, the reason I think it's a good example, right? We kind of went through this already, but from a different angle, the reason we like MMA as a comparison so much is that it's just such a great example of of competition yielding unpredictable results, right? Like things mm-hmm. you can't model, you can't know in advance, you have to just see what happens, right? Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, none of that data I mentioned, you know, for like building the model exists in MMA. Unfortunately, it does <laughs> in finance. And so this is where I think the cargo cult element comes in that people start off just with this absolute flood of data and think, oh, I need to do something with this. Like I can't, I can't ignore this. This is this is important. This must be important. Everyone else is doing something with it. I have to do something with it too. And it's it's incredibly freeing to just say, no, you don't. <laughs> you can just ignore all of it. I promise. No. Um. So you the the next chapter, just the titling of this. I wish I could scream this from the mountaintops, Alan. <laughs> and the title is "This is not capitalism." Mm-hmm. And uh, you get into a lot of your opinions on uh, GDP being just such a worthless uh, metric, but mm-hmm. the thing that everybody's hyper focused on, among some other things. But I think that there's, uh, I think this is a really important thing, just beyond like some of those in your face metrics from a societal standpoint, um, where you have these movement movements of very young generations that are looking at the branding of this is capitalism. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And like it's destructive because what they think the label is is nothing of the sort if they actually were able yeah. to understand what's the mechanics of of all these crazy terms of backstop facilities and quantitative easing and you name it uh re- reverse repo facilities like all of this like give us your you know down and dirty on what you guys were really trying to accomplish with this well that's i mean that's exactly why we named this. so this was an article before the book um this was i think actually the first article of of any that then went into uh some of the chapters of the book uh and we wrote it in i want to say april 2020 20, and what we were responding to was just massive bailouts, right? It was the start of the uh, COVID money printing extravaganza. And it was being labeled in, you know, popular press, uh, kind of mainstream culture's understanding of this was that this is capitalism, right? And our, there's quite a few strands to our argument, I think, but the, the simplest version this is more or less a quote from the book because I remember uh, the line I'm about to say went in because we were saying it in real life so many times <laughs> that that if anything, the article kind of came out of that, that for something to be capital, like if you're talking about capitalism, it almost doesn't matter what what you mean, whatever, or what you're in fact analyzing, anything that has the name capitalism for that to make any sense, be an applicable name. Surely, at least, it has to refer to growing stocks of capital. And it can potentially even refer to lots of other horrible stuff. Um, I don't think that's really necessary. That's almost like a um, kind of an olive branch to uh, people who um, you know wouldn't necessarily identify positively with capitalism, but but are you know nonetheless seeing the 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 horrors i suppose i don't mean to be too dramatic but you know seeing what is is truly awful about endless money printing and and some other kind of i'd say more obscure more downstream stuff of fiat banking um those people who are perhaps even correctly identifying a lot of these symptoms are being told that capitalism is the cause mm-hmm. in in some cases even by people who you know, are the champions of all the activity in the first place. It, a, a lot of it's kind of apologism. It's it's that, oh, well, this is what capitalism requires. This is like the occasional downside of capitalism is that, yeah, we need to print a whole bunch of money and, you know, save all these people who made terrible decisions. But but yeah, our our claim is 
which I, I don't think is even really that controversial because it's not even, it's more just about language than, than about economics, I guess, that if you're calling something capitalism, even before you're criticizing, right, if you're calling it capitalism, you ought to be mindful of how capital is being treated and, and very probably that it's just, you know, you've just been lied to. What you're looking at is, is something else. Hence, this is not capitalism. Well, you do you do such a great job uh, talking about GDP, right? And so when you oh, GDP is a great one, yeah, yeah, yeah. You you lay this out, and you're to to help people understand it better. You're saying this is the top line. This would be like me looking at a company and saying, well, the yeah, top, yeah, yeah, their top line keeps expanding. Their top line keeps expanding, but never take never glimpsing at the bottom line and realizing if there's yep. any actual value accretion happening yeah, inside yeah. of that entity. And from a governmental standpoint, um, you're saying that these people that are looking at GDP and it's the percent just keeps going up, but they never take a look at the value accretion that's happening and mm -hmm. totally ignoring that. Yeah. What what you're like, I guess the the effect of this is a, a focus on the the incentive of um of consumption as mm -hmm. opposed to uh, long-term value accretion that yeah. is sustainable yeah. over time is, is what I was trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm really glad that you made the comparison to a company's financial statements. And um, I would have done it if you hadn't. And I think actually given, you know, your likely audience, right? People with, uh, if not working professionally in finance, I guess, with some kind of background, like highly financially literate, it's, it's an extremely useful comparison to make. I think because maybe similarly to, to the MMA example that is for most people is more accessible, right? That GDP as a macro term feels, I don't know if it, it feels distant. It only, it feels beyond being able to analyze straightforwardly. Uh, again, it's one of these things where we'd argue, well, no, if you have the right tools, if you have the right methodology, it's not at all. And in fact, it compares very, very nicely to to the equivalent terms for for a company so just to to tease that out a bit further yeah what you're i i i push your argument a little bit further than just leaving it at revenue versus profit so yes it's basically saying oh revenue's going up therefore that's a good thing like that's our our metric for success uh which is kind of obviously silly in its own right profit would clearly be better because that means that you know you're Re revenue, I, if you think in like really first principles terms, revenue proves that somebody values what you're doing, right? Profit proves that you are providing that value efficiently. You're producing more than you're consuming in delivering that value. But the thing you, re even profit, we would argue is not enough. The thing that you really need is returns because it's it's profit going back into your stock of capital, creating the assets that when operated, create revenue. It's that cycle that's important. And so this is a distinction between, I guess, the stocks of capital on the one hand. In a company, it's, you know, it's pretty straightforward to calculate these ratios. It does become a bit more abstract in the case of, well, everything, yeah. a country, I don't know, an, an economy, I guess. Um, but sticking to the right principles, I think, is still fairly straightforward. I think the difference is basically you can't really know what the numbers are, um, but you can still distinguish between you know what you're identifying as good or bad, basically. So, so GDP is purely the revenue and it's purely consumption. It says nothing at all about what I would argue is just real wealth. I think that's the kind of the cardinal sin here is mistaking GDP for wealth. Uh, GDP is the effect of the real wealth of a stock of productive capital. It is not itself wealth, and it certainly doesn't cause wealth. So just being really clear on these distinctions, I think is, I think is really important. There's actually, there's, there's, I don't know if you remember this, or if you have this uh, sort of noted in, in detail, there are two other critiques that we have of GDP that make this even worse. So like that's everything I just went through there that is like measuring the wrong thing in the first place. Uh, is only part of the problem. Do you want me to say the other two? Yeah, yeah, please. Yes, anyway? sir. Okay, yeah. cool. So, um, so the second one is that it's, and actually, I'll say even before this, the listeners will pick up a lot of the same threads 
like again and again. I won't deliberately go back and link it to MMA every time, but you the again the reason we introduce MMA is that the more accessible points in that discussion just come up over and over and over again in a really nice way. So the second one is that because it is such a top-down metric, it obscures the individuals it actually refers to. So it's it's an average that doesn't really exist in terms of the average person it describes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the reason is basically that it's weighted by consumption. So it's first of all, it's bad enough that it's just consumption, but it's it it points to an an average individual weighted by the consumption of all the actual individuals. Mm. So as opposed to a median, just mm-hmm. to be really clear, right? Like because like that probably sounded all kind of fluffy and abstract. Um it's entirely possible, just to like really make the point, it's entirely possible that everybody bar one person got poorer or you know, consumed less. Uh, but one person consumed so, so, so much more that they made up for everybody else's losses and then GDP would still have gone up, right? And like, or GDP per capita would still have gone up, whereas obviously the median would have would have gone down. Um, and so it's, yeah, it, it's kind of, no, it, it purports to be more democratic, I suppose, in a democratic in a very loose sense, in speaking for the average rather than just, you know, the 1% or whatever. Um, but it's actually highly skewed towards the already rich. And and the um the the example I gave, the kind of deliberately ridiculous example, isn't even that far off reality. I don't think if you look over certain, you know, if you if you if you find the right periods. There are indeed times where more than the gr- the growth in GDP goes to just some upper percentage. So the entire you know X percent down have in fact gotten poorer, but the X percent up have gotten richer faster than they've gotten poorer. So again, GDP per capita has gone up. So that's another reason. It's um, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't maybe read too much into that kind of ethically you could uh you know one could be very offended by this uh my point is more you can only make this mistake in the first place again if you're thinking if your starting point is very much top down data and mm-hmm. and you're not clear about where that's where that's leading you uh so that's point number 2 point number 3 is maybe the most interesting of all uh that it changes over time in a way that is essentially unmeasurable. So this is never really a big deal from, for example, one year to the next. It's still, I'm not claiming like, oh, it just doesn't tell you anything at all. It still clearly does tell you something. But the problem is that every year, and then this is clearly truer on longer and longer time horizons, uh, there are new inventions, right? There are new products, there are new services that come into the overall calculation of GDP and then there are old ones that drop out. And if you roll your period of time forward long enough, eventually nothing in the old GDP calculation will be in the new one in terms of what is being consumed. Year to year, it's not that big a deal because most of it's still the same. And then the argument, the the kind of, I would say somewhat fallacious argument against what I'm now putting forward would be Oh, but that's fine because there are, you know, it's still, things are repriced, right? There are exchange rates. So you can see how much people value the new thing by how much they're willing to pay for it, which is true in the moment, but it becomes meaningless when everything has changed. And on a long enough time horizon, everything will have changed. So an example that we we give in the book, I'm, I'm going to get the exact stats wrong here, uh, but it's kind of along the right lines, uh, is that the... GDP of, um, I think it, what, who was it we chose? I think it was the, the GDP per capita of Vietnamese today, I believe is around the GDP per capita of Americans in the, I forget exactly when, but in the late 19th century. We would also argue it's kind of ridiculous to say that therefore they are as wealthy, mm-hmm. Vietnamese today are as wealthy as Americans were then, because every single part of their lives didn't exist for those Americans. And and you would argue is maybe not every single aspect is better, but every everything they consume 
is of a higher quality, I suppose. Is and, and you can it's almost definitionally true because they're choosing to consume these newer things. So, like, mm-hmm. I think probably one of the more pronounced examples we we gave, I believe, was something like penicillin, right? Mm-hmm. Like, there's mm-hms. there's no and this this kind of winds its way towards like a, a a nice catchy slogan for this, which is that there's no exchange rates to the future. So you, you can say, oh, but you can you still reprice these things when you do the new calculation. So you can see how much people value them, but you can't, they need to exist before you can value them, yeah. right? You can't value something that doesn't exist yet. And so to use GDP as, which is how it's almost always used as well, just to be clear, like, I don't think a good way out of this is like, oh, well, just don't use it that way. Like, this is all it exists in order to, like, this is the only point anybody ever makes with it is, oh, GDP went up, therefore we're better off. Well, the longer... The longer you run this out, the more meaningless it becomes. Yeah. So that's problem number three. So it's meaningless or no, it's funnier in the other direction, I guess. Problem number one is it measures the wrong thing. Uh, Problem number two is it measures the right thing in the wrong way, in a deeply unfair way. And then problem number three is it's meaningless anyway. So who cares? It's it's meaningless today and it's going to be even more meaningless tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Uh, you have a quote in here, and I'm going to transition the conversation more to Bitcoin topics. Uh, you have a quote in the book that I, for me personally, as a person that served in the military, this quote is just so profound. After a millennia of compounding technology advances, taking us from swords, shields, longbows, handguns, fighter jets, and atomic bombs, humanity has discovered a technology that only resists and disincentivizes violence and has no other use. Mm. This is a big deal. And I, I think for yeah. people that are not Bitcoiners that are hearing that, it's almost like an eye roll that there's no way that this magic internet money could possibly like reverse uh, human nature of using force and all of those ideas. So lay it on that person. Sure. Um well, one thing I'll say up front, I don't want to take too much credit for the the thought behind that line. I think it's a fairly, first of all, it's it's completely understood by anybody in Bitcoin. It's one of the first things you you wrap your head around. I think the actual source of it probably predates Bitcoin by quite a bit. I I, I just in slightly more abstract terms, I think I probably trace this to the sovereign individual. Mm-hmm. Um, Although obviously they weren't talking about Bitcoin, they were talking in slightly more general terms about uh, the use of cryptography online. But obviously Bitcoin is a is a you know the the perfect um, example of this, and I think to a large extent validation of that thesis as well. So if if people are interested in this line of thinking, I would go read that book. I wouldn't credit me with this thought. Um, but to your point of okay, so what do you say to someone who who just doesn't take this idea seriously at all. I think probably the best the best resource for this that I've come across is actually extremely recent. I think I, again because it's just kind of common knowledge within with, within Bitcoiners for a lot of people. You, you know, you probably don't even really need to write it down or explain it. But uh, Lynn Alden's new book, Broken mm-hmm. Money, explains this very very well. Yes. Uh, so I'd recommend probably people just go buy <laughs> go buy that as well. <laughs> um, and she says it better than I will now effectively try to summarize what she says. Um, but her her argument, where I mean one of many, many arguments in that book, is that what is different about fiat money with, with the kind of money that we have ended up with now? What is really historically unique about it is that it has reduced the cost of violence to basically zero. Um, and to be fair, actually, this is something that we touched on at the very end of, of Bitcoin is Venice. Um, but I think Lynn does a far better job of explaining it. Um, and I think you... It's it's the effects of this are so pervasive that it's it's almost like this is water in a way that you you can go your whole life without ever actually noticing it. So I it, in some sense I understand where the eye roll maybe comes from, 
Um, but once it's pointed out that to maybe make it a bit more tangible, that there is now, or there hasn't been for you know fifty years or so, at least definitely for the U.S. and then less so for you know the basically the more allied to the U.S. you are. There is no cost whatsoever to to waging war. Previously, like for for all of history, to some or other extent, and basically the extent gets less and less the closer you get to pure fiat. A government that wanted to wage a war would require the consent of its populace, the consent of the governed, to fund it by a taxation. And by and large, people really hate that. Like they really don't like being taxed for war. Um, and I think a, a key a key turning point in all of this, actually, which um, Saifedean has, has done a really good job um, sort of articulating and, and actually with some some historical research into this as well, like popularizing this, you know, previously apparently just unknown historical fact of what the Bank of England did at the start of World War One. And so Safe has this great line, which is that Bitcoin is the technology that will finally end World War One. And so this is what he's just referring to that um, when, so at the time the uh, pound sterling was the world reserve currency and the, in order to finance World War One, the Bank of England had to uh, break the peg to gold. Um, but the, the way that they, the process by which they went about doing this, and this is what Lynn details uh, in in broken money, uh, it like in in a lot of detail. I, she doesn't just mention it; like she really examines this this episode. Is that they, in fact, tried to issue war bonds, and they were incredibly unpopular. Uh, which I guess is in part because of the somewhat unusual circumstances that World War One came out of. You know, it wasn't it wasn't like the UK was being invaded or anything. It's kind of obvious knowing the you know the web of alliances and so on that the british people would not care about this they would not be interested in it um but the bank of england just lied they they said that the war bond was massively oversubscribed they wrote in uh the financial times as well it took to propagate this official lie and then the the the, the, the ft published a, a, an apology or like kind of a correction, kind of an apology in something like 2017, <laughs> you know, more than a hundred years later, uh, when the, when the records proving it, which had been hidden at the time were finally dug up from the bank of England and the bank of England themselves admitted that this had happened. And the FD was like, okay, well we can apologize for it too. Uh, and so th this is like really pivotal because, um, the, the the peg to gold was never returned. I mean, no, you know, once any peg to a to a hard money is broken, you never really get it back. But that's that you could argue that was the first domino that led right the way up to uh, you know, WJF happened in, in 1971. I'm obviously skipping over an enormous amount there, but that's why you should go read Broken Money anyway. It is a fantastic book. I have to agree with you there. All right, Alan. Such a pleasure chatting with you. This has been a blast, but I'm curious, like, what does your next three to five years, like, what do you got in store? What are you working on right now? You always seem to be up to something. Oh, awesome. God. I don't even know what my next three to five months is going to be like, but um, <laughs> I, can, I can speculate, I guess. So, yeah, I mentioned before I, I used to work at this big asset management company. Uh, Sasha still works. I left a little over a year ago to start this company, Axiom. Um, for now, we have a venture fund that is focused on Bitcoin companies or Bitcoin adjacent companies. Um, we we did a, a kind of a public launch maybe two months ago now, which which coincided with just I guess maybe some of your <laughs> some of your listeners will be interested. Um, it was kind of pitched around a, a a new piece of writing that I had done, kind of an essay, I, I guess, which is actually the first I'd done since uh, since Bitcoin is Venice and saving it up for a while for the launch. Uh, talking about a lot of the same things. Um, the the tagline, I guess, is that the the killer app of Bitcoin is fixing the cost of capital. So it's you know covering a lot of the same topics that we that we've covered now. But but I think also part of the point was to set out the vision for the the business because we have uh, we have this venture fund. You know, we're hoping that we'll be able to. Uh, raise and launch, you know, many more down the lines. So long as there is a need for funding in the Bitcoin ecosystem, we want to try to contribute to that. Um, but we also have plans to launch 
let's say, more exotic financing instruments for Bitcoin companies. I don't want to say too much more about that now, just knowing the stage they're at and you know how much of a regulatory nightmare basically every part of that is. Um, I'll wait until they actually exist before I start, you know, bragging about them. But uh, but I'm excited at what we're what we're hopeful we're we're going to be able to do, um, and and yeah, hopefully contribute to or maybe even take advantage of. I guess if we're successful enough, uh, Bitcoin fixing the the cost of capital. I love it. I love that uh, that theme and that branding. By the way, uh, for people that are not familiar with this book that we were talking about, it's Bitcoin is Venice. Uh, wow. Very, very impressive. Uh, I wish I could, to be quite honest with you, I wish I could write like this. Well, I cannot, like, I promise you, I can't not even come close much. to this, this level of writing skill. Uh, but, um, just an honor and a pleasure to get to know you and to have you on the show and to talk about this amazing book. And thank you for your time for, for coming on. Yeah. Thank you for having me. What the invention of Bitcoin is, in a way, is the first introduction of a credible way to settle final value nearly as quickly as we can do transactions. The kind of the first period of human history was everything slow. And then the period of history from the telegraph up till right before Bitcoin was transactions are fast, but settlements are slow. And post Bitcoin, we're in a world where final value is fast as well. So transactions and settlements can all move roughly at the speed of light.